everybody. We're going to encourage you guys to uh, sing along with this this morning. You should know this one if you've been around here a while. And I don't see any new faces this morning, so everybody in here should sing. And we might need some help because Dan might need some help singing this morning. you guys to stand and greet your neighbor find somebody maybe you don't know or you hadn't talked to maybe this week and say hello this morning and if you're online we encourage you to join us and send us a shout out on the facebook chat
y'all. I'm going to let you sit down for just a short period of time. If I can get your attention for some announcements. We're so glad you've joined us here this this morning or soon to be afternoon. Um, we have Pastor Dan here. He is uh, will graciously um, have a great sermon for us, we have no doubt, today. Uh, so if you have anything particular that you want Pastor Dan to know about this morning, I'm sure he would love to hear about that. Um, if you have a prayer request or anything like that, let him know. And um, if you did not pick up a bulletin, I'm going to encourage you to get one of those. It tells you all about everything that's going on at Pleasant View at the main campus, all kinds of stuff, which is great. If you would like to sign the booklet, we certainly encourage you to do that. If you want us to, if you want to leave your email address, we encourage you to do that. And things that go out through the week. Uh, prayer requests or different things going on in the life of Pleasant View. That's how we get it out to folks is through that's called an agape email. So if you're interested in getting those and you are not getting those, put your email on that book and we'll make sure we can get you on that list. Pastor Dale has resumed his Wednesday night Bible study. Um, it, it happens on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. at the main campus. And uh, they are working on um, the focus is on Wesleyan traditions and doctrines. And if you never had a Pastor Dale Bible study, it's great. Yes, Bob. Oh, I don't know. It just says they've resumed. Yeah, Joy had mentioned that last week. I think uh, they won't have it this Wednesday, but okay. he'll be back uh, the following Wednesday. Well, let's see what it. It doesn't have it on here, so I'm guessing plan for a week for Wednesday. Okay. Yes. Uh, but any either way. Uh, Dale does a great job in Bible study. Um, if you've never attended one of his, they're, they're great. He does a great job. And on October the 7th at 5 o'clock at the main campus uh, in the Family Life Center, Fellowship Hall, they're going to be having a mission celebration and barbecue dinner uh, for everything that went on this year and all the in the life of Pleasant View, all the, mission, all the mission work that happened. So if you are interested in supporting that and going there to hear those testimonies, that's, at, again, 5 o'clock on Saturday, October the 7th. And that's all the announcements I know of. Do you know of anything, Pastor Dan? Thing real quick. Um, I, I always hate doing this, but I got to run out right after the service because I've got... <laughs> okay, <sake> of... <laughs> L-A-H-O. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got to be at the theater at 1 o'clock if I can. So um, I love you dearly, but I'm going to have to scoot out of here. So... Um, won't be able to hang out and talk today but uh, do let me know if you have prayer concerns so please awesome so we're going to encourage everybody to stand and sing with us this should be a song you guys know well it's called good good father and it's just a great worship song so stand and sing with us this morning
undeniable I, I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me to our prayer time this morning gosh I'm just going to call you to own that this morning that he is a good good father and he is perfect in every way and I'm loved by him and you're loved by him and it's who I am I'm a child of God and what a great 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 privilege that is what a great privilege and an honor so if you've got anything particular that you want lifted up this morning I know we need to be thinking about Tony and uh, Teresa Williams, Bob. A friend of yours in North Carolina is having surgery this week. What was that? Brother in North Carolina. His brother in North Carolina. Sorry, it's hard for me to hear up here. Um, definitely, Bob, thank you for, for sharing that. Does anybody else have anything particular that we need to lift up this morning? Prayers, uh, Dan's friend Sharon, she lost her mother this week. It's certainly a good time for us all to come together, and if we've got things that we need to lift up, I know we need to still lift up the, the Buffalo family. They've got a lot of things um, that they're dealing with right now, so um, we'll lift them up for sure. And um, let's just be mindful to be praised, praising the Lord that He loves us enough to come into these situations no matter what, no matter what's happening. He is there with us. So, um, if you have anything particular that you want um, lifted up this morning, um, you can ask, tell Dan, and we can also put that on the cross. But um, for those of you that anybody out there struggling in life, anybody struggle in life and things going on, um, this song is talking about, it's called You Say, and it talks about all the things that we fight when we look in the mirror, when we hear the voices in our head, and we fight them all the time of what the world tells us. And we've got to remember that um, he says that we're loved. He says that we're strong. He says he says that we're held. So remember that in those deep, 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 dark days, you are loved. I keep finding voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than 
just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. truly believe that we belong to you, Lord. And we're so grateful that you love us enough to call us your own. Lord, thank you for that promise. And Jesus, thank you for that promise each and every day that when things are tough, that you are always there. And that you always hold us strong. And that you give us the strength to go through each and every day. Lord, we thank you for that. And we lift that up in praise to you first and foremost this morning. And Lord, as you know, there's stuff on our hearts and our minds this morning, and we just want to lift those up to you. Because you know it's, there's folks that are mourning and they're facing some difficult health issues, worried about upcoming surgeries. Lord, it's the unknown. But Lord, we know that you already know what's in that situation. And we lift that up to you, Lord. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for that provision and for that grace and that hope and faith. Lord, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for the words that you've laid on Dan's heart this morning and that we'll all hear this message and that we'll hear it, we'll understand it, and Lord, that we'll use it this week to be your hands and feet in this world. Because it is a broken world, Lord, and it always has been. Since sin came into the garden, it's been a broken world, but Lord, you have always been there. So help us to be that light that shines your grace and mercy. Help us to know that there's a, there's a better home for each and every one of us. And that the world is just the world. That you are eternal. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the understanding. Even a glimpse of an understanding that you love us that much. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for a Savior in Jesus. And it is in his mighty, mighty name that we ask all these things. Amen.
pastors here at Pleasant View Church, and uh, delighted to see each one of you. Uh, delighted for you to join us online, too. And um, I'm going to be reading today from the Gospel of Matthew. If you've got your Bibles and you want to follow along, I'm in Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to begin in verse 1, uh, and this is Jesus um, talking here. So uh, here with me, God's saying something new to us today uh, in the words of Jesus. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw that others were standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. And when he went out again, about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last, work, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. So when I was a kid, probably one of my favorite refrains was, Hey, that's not fair. You ever done that? <laughs> you ever had children? If you've ever had children, you've heard that. <laughs> oh, I, I see some finger pointing back there. <laughs> hey, that's not fair. And usually it's the younger kid, right? Uh, pointing out like the older kids getting to do this or that. We've seen that in our family once or twice. Um, one of our kids, uh, who shall be nameless, um, <laughs> always... I'm always like worried about preaching about my kids. I don't want them to, you know. Uh, so I try not to. But uh, this is just too cute. They would, they would do this. And they didn't even say, that's not fair. They would just go, not fair. You know, and it became very emphatic. And you knew immediately, like, okay, well, there's a justice issue here. Let's figure it out. So one time a dad responded, well, the fair is actually not here. It's in August, and that's where we judge the pigs. <laughs> that got nowhere with the child. I remember saying it to my parents when I was a college student. They um, had sent my sister, who uh, is older, and she had just graduated from college. They sent her on a big trip. And, of course, me and my brother chimed in, who my brother's younger than me. Not fair. Um, and I'll say, uh, to my parents' credit, uh, they were very fair to us when we graduated and sent us on a big trip, too. And we actually got to go together, which was great fun. But at the time, I was upset because it wasn't fair. I was a kid, too. Was I less loved? And we don't just say it to our parents, and our, we don't just hear it from our children. We say it to one another, don't we? We say it commonly in our society in many different ways. We say it in our homes and in our friendships. We say it in our workplace. Uh, often we have to say it to a boss or someone who's in a position of power. And, of course, it's not always true when we say it necessarily, but many times it is, and it's a struggle in our society. There's an uh, auto worker strike going on right now claiming that very issue. If you boiled it down, they're sitting there saying, this is not fair. You know, our, our pay is not fair. 
Um, so we see it in many things. Uh, we see it such a valued um, uh, matter in our society that we've even enshrined it in the Constitution that we have equal rights under the law. But this all flows from a sense of justice that is actually biblically rooted, uh, which is a, a thing of God. God cares about justice, and God cares about fairness. And, and uh, I think that's where that wells up in us, you know, that there's something deep within us that cares about justice and fairness, at least for many of us we do. In our society, uh, not only do we see it with um, striking workers and in other situations, but we also see uh, many legitimate claims about unfairness in the way that minority groups are treated. And I think way too often uh, on, on all matters of societal fairness, the church is silent. You know, we, we turn religion into this personalized, private thing. And it is always very personal. What you have with Jesus, what you have with God in and through Christ is very much a personal matter, but it's never a private matter. And most all the New Testament letters are written to a church community about what it means to live together in the company of one another and how we are to be a light to the world. And part of that is sharing God's justice and fairness um, in the appropriate settings there. And sometimes we actually dare say to God, not fair, right? Can you ever think of a time in your life where you've said that to God? I have to raise a hand. But uh, I imagine probably for all of us, there's been some point in our lives where we turn to God and say, not fair. And I think this parable gets at the heart of saying to God, not fair. And so what we're going to look at today in the parable is this teaching of Jesus on um, a basic principle that is part of his kingdom, that the last shall be first and the first shall be last and how that relates to this idea of fairness. So we're going to look at the context of, of the parable. Uh, I always think that's so important that um, when we're looking into the scripture, we don't just pull out like our little favorite verse, and maybe your favorite verse is the first shall be last and the last shall be first, especially if you were like in last place or if you were at the end of the line, you know, you like that verse all of a sudden. But we always need to put these verses and these principles and these teachings in the context of uh, what is surrounding it, what comes before, what comes after, where Jesus is. And so we're going to look at that today and hear that principle explained um, through the parable of the vineyard. We'll go through that, make sure we've got a grasp on what Jesus is actually saying. And what we're going to hear is, is that there's a problem in criticizing God is kind of what it boils down to. Um, and it, it's a, presented as an issue of fairness by the workers, but it really, from God's point of view, is a matter of generosity. So we're going to explore God's generosity that becomes scandalous to these workers in the vineyard. And that invites us to an next step of faith, I think, for all of us. Uh, if you've not uh, professed a faith in Jesus, um, this is your opportunity today to do that. To say, hey, God, I want to be part of, of the generous living that you invite me to. I want to trust you with my life. I want to trust you with everything that I have. And, and try and live my life according to to your will and your way, empowered by your spirit. And that's your invitation today, as it is every day. Uh, and for those of us who've been on the journey a while, trying to figure out this following Jesus thing, um, if you're like me, you find out you don't quite do it perfectly, right? Uh, so this is another opportunity for us to come to the throne of grace and recognize the places we've gotten it wrong and to just cry out to God and say, hey, uh, can you help me with this? I need some help with this, God. And trust that his spirit is a spirit of forgiveness uh, and is a spirit of grace and as we will study in the parable a spirit of generosity that invites us into new life so let's look at the context um, <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples have left the Galilee region of northern Israel uh, which was kind of the home base for Jesus uh, in his teachings he'd, he'd travel around he'd, he'd go to uh, different synagogues he'd go to different villages different towns he would speak you know out on the plains and on the mountainsides the hillsides and so he's been doing that um, and this is coming toward the end of his ministry so this is another set of teaching that we have in Matthew's gospel where Jesus has uh, been walking around and teaching and and he started to draw huge crowds and they are following him still um, and he is uh, healing people as well um, he as he's left Galilee and he's heading down 
Um, if you look at a map of Israel, you're heading from northern um, Galilee region, northern Israel, uh, to, to head toward Jerusalem down in the south. And so he's kind of going by way of the Jordan River, and he's out in this area called Beyond the Jordan at this point. Um, but still, the crowds are following him, um, which is just really interesting to me, because if you've been to that land, you would know that this is an arid, dry place, uh, which, you know, there's not a ton of people who live out in this region, unlike the Galilee, where you had towns and villages um, in a very fertile area. Uh, so yet he's still drawing these massive crowds, these, these people who want to hear him. Uh, the disciples are with him, of course, and he's, he's heading towards Jerusalem eventually. But he's out in uh, kind of the Judean countryside at this point. Now, this teaching, Matthew 20, that we read from comes, um, uh, of course, <laughs> 20 follows 19. So chapter 19 is also part of this teaching that Jesus has given. And I want to put this in the context of that teaching of Jesus. He's been teaching, um, when exa for example, when a, a young man came to him and said, what must I do to receive the kingdom? Jesus basically says, well, sell everything you got, because this was a rich young man, and follow me. And, and the young man went away sad, because he knew he couldn't do it. Uh, so we hear themes of, of giving up worldly things, giving up worldly ideas, giving up worldly values to follow Jesus. And <clears throat> then... Um, the disciples who've been following Jesus for a while and who've already given up quite a bit, they're like, wow, if, if that guy can't join in, then can any of us? And Jesus is reemphasizing that point of giving up. But he says, look, with humans, if you're trusting in your own strength and your own value and your own things, um, you're never going to make it. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So that's in the chapter 19. And then he says... Uh, and this is at the end of, of chapter 19 and verse 30, if you've got your Bibles. Um, he says, uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And we actually heard that at the end of this teaching too. So I want you to think of that being a, an important principle to the vineyard parable. Uh, it's bookended on both sides. You know, Jesus lays out the principle, he teaches the vineyard parable, and then he, he says, and this is what the kingdom of God has looked like. Looks like, and he says, uh, the principle again, the first shall be last and the last first. <clears throat> At the heart of, of, of this teaching is this great reversal that, that God comes to us in unexpected ways and challenges some of our basic notions about what it means to be human and just how we live as human beings. And God kind of interrupts that and turns things upside down sometimes for us and challenges our ways of thinking. And that's what we see in the vineyard parable. So let's look at that. Now, um, you heard that the parable of the vineyard is the way Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of heaven. What do you know about the kingdom of heaven at this point? Far off distant land one day we get to? Yes, we hope so. But Jesus is teaching about life in the here and now in this parable. As he so often does, as he so often refers to the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the kingdom of God, the reign of God present in the lives of human beings today as they walk on the earth. It's not just a distant future reality, but it's about what life is like, how we're supposed to live life on earth inside the love and the reign of God, right? So kingdom of heaven. So you should know that by now. I've said that many, many times, but always worth repeating. So the landowner, uh, who is God in this parable, uh, sometimes the, the person in authority is not always the symbol for God, but here the landowner is. And we get that because he owns the vineyard. And in this parable, there's one vineyard. There's not a lot of vineyards. Vineyards were very common in Israel in Jesus' day. Uh, and you would often have people work in your vineyard. So Jesus is telling the parable uh, in a way that people would really understand. And he says, the, land, the landowner goes out early in the morning and he hires some workers. Now, the, the work day in Israel would have started about 6 a.m. And so you would go out and you would hire workers and they would work 10, 11, 12 hours. 12 hours was not unusual. So 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is a typical work day uh, in the vineyard uh, for anybody in Israel. And the workers agree with the landowner that he will pay them the usual day's wage. Now, from last week, if you were part of our, our, our congregation and part of the, the here, and you heard the message, you would have heard that a usual day's wage is what? Say it again. A denarius, yes. Uh, you get the gold star today. Very good, Rachel. So, <laughs> yay. So, um, so 
he said, and, and so that's what you see in the Greek. A, a dinar, a denarius, uh, is what was offered to the, uh, the people who go out at 6 a.m. So they were getting what they agreed on, right? A, a full day's wage for a full day's work. Sounds fair, right? Sounds fair to me. Okay, so the workers agree. They go out, they start working, and it's a hot day, and it's a, uh, a day where the harvest has come in, so they need more help. And the owner of the vineyard realizes this, and he says, I'm going to go get some more workers. So at 9 a.m., he goes out. He goes back into the marketplace. He finds some more workers, and he says, come work with me, and I'll give you what's right. And so they agree. Um, and he does the same thing at noon. He needs more workers to get the work done for the day. He goes out and gets them. He does the same thing at 3 o'clock. He does the same thing at 5 p.m., one hour before the end of the workday, because they want to finish the job, right? So he says the same thing to them. You come out, and I'll pay you what's right. One hour left in the workday. Um, and he actually asked them, he says, why, why are you still standing here? It's like 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and the workday started at 6 when he, when he meets these people in the, in the marketplace. And they say, well, no one would hire us. You know, we're, we're here, we're ready, we're available. Uh, but no one would hire us. So the, the vineyard owner, uh, out of need perhaps, out of some sympathy perhaps, he hires them and brings them into the vineyard, and they work an hour. And so he tells his manager, he says, all right, let's go ahead and start paying them. End of the day's here at 6 p.m. They want to go home. Uh, they want to enjoy the fruits of their labor, so let's pay the ones who came last first. And he gives them a full day's wage. And he's going to work backwards on who worked the shortest to who worked the longest, right? So the first ones in the vineyard get paid last. Uh, the first ones to get paid, notice, worked one hour, and he paid them for 12, right? Paid them for a full day's wage. Now, that sounds pretty generous to me. I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to have that arrangement in my life where I work one hour and get paid for 12. That'd be pretty sweet. Um, that's what he does here. So the... Uh, the folks who were hired first, they hear about this, and boy, are they smiling big, right? Because they're thinking, well, this is a really fair landowner. He's been really nice to us. He offered us a full day's wage in the beginning, and he's probably going to give us 12 times what he just gave these guys because they worked one hour. He gave them a full day's wage. We worked 12 hours longer, so we're probably going to get 12 days worth of working wages for working one. That's going to be pretty awesome. Two weeks worth of work being paid for. And what does a landowner do? He gives them a full day's wage, one, right? So the people that worked one hour got the same pay as the people that worked 12 hours. And what do the people that worked 12 hours do? What would you do? You would grumble. <laughs> I would grumble, you would grumble, we would all grumble. It would be a grumble fest. And we would talk bad about the landowner, and um, we would say, hey, that's not fair. Hey, landowner, that's really just not fair. You know, we put in 12 hours. We were out in the scorching sun. We did the heavy work. These guys come in one hour left in the day, and you give them the exact same thing, and that's just not fair, just not right. You know, you need to make it right with us. I don't know if you've ever held a job and been there for, say, five, ten years, and somebody comes in and, they're basically doing the same job. Uh, maybe if you knew you even have a little um, more seniority in the status than them, and it gets to the place where um, a promotion is coming due, and they get hired over you, you say, oh, man, that's awesome. Congratulations. Maybe you do. <laughs> but your probably initial reaction is, hey, man, that's not fair, right? That, that's our human nature, you know. We, we, we think, all right, well, you get what you um, earned, right? So pay me what I earned. And the landowner then actually says, well, hey, guess what? I did pay you. Did I not? What we agreed upon? You said you'd come out and work 12 days in my vineyard, and I paid you. Or 12 hours in my vineyard, and I paid you. A usual day's wage for 12 hours. So can you complain? To me now the problem with the analysis that the workers are doing is they're they're treating the vineyard owner Todd as if it's the employer of you down the street 
as if it's you know somebody on your sports team who came in late and uh, you've been working harder than them and, and they got to uh, fill the position you wanted to fill and you're sitting on the bench you know and you say not fair and you're judging by human standards Jesus is saying look when, when it's the reign of God and the kingdom of God things are going to look different the first shall be last and the last shall be first and so first of all he makes these points on judging God Hey, God, that's not fair. Well, actually, let me remind you of this. The scriptures also teach us that we see through a mirror dimly. And, and mirrors back in that day were very dim, actually. They were made of this metal that weren't polished. They're not the mirrors we have today. Uh, so it was really hard to see a good reflection of yourself. You couldn't see the true self when you looked in a mirror. And Paul uses that analogy to say, look, that's how we see the kingdom of God. We we don't see the true reflection of what it is. We see with our human eyes and our human limitations. And many times we hear in the scriptures time and time again that God's ways are not our ways. Right? We see that throughout the Psalms and in many places in the scriptures. And yet we want to be the ones to say to God, God, you're not being fair. You're letting the slackers go ahead of us. You're letting the people that break rules get in line. I mean, have you ever been driving along the road uh, at the interstate and there's one lane closed and you're dutifully, like, minding your own business, you know, creeping up in your lane, and then some um, smart aleck comes zooming by in the lane that's closed and passes you, and you're like, that's not fair. And what Jesus is trying to say is, is we do this to God. And so there are some problems when we do that to God. The first point that Jesus makes is, is God is fair. He keeps his promises, right? He made the promise to the vineyard workers that I'll pay you a usual day's wage if you put in the work. So he kept his promise. He made a covenant. He honored his covenant with those who come into the vineyard early. But then the second point is that He's the vineyard owner. And you're not, <laughs> if you're a vineyard worker, right? And so does he have, now, let me be clear, this is not an analogy for businesses to <laughs> treat their employees in the workplace. This is about the reign of God and the nature of God. And so you're not comparing human-made businesses with how they treat their workers. You're comparing yourself and your ways to God's ways and Jesus reminds us that the vineyard is God's and so he says he says look I, I can't do with my vineyard as I see fit I can't be gracious and, and generous and merciful in my vineyard if I want to that's what the vineyard workers are telling him The reign of God is that God will be generous with whoever he chooses. And I think this raises some really challenging questions, not, not necessarily for the rest of society. It does. We've got all kind of questions for society about justice and fairness, and those are concerns of God, very much so. But I think this particular parable is really important to life in the church and how you live as a follower of Jesus. It raises questions for us as how we treat one another. I've been a, a pastor for you know twenty plus years, and um, most of that has been in the United Methodist Church. And we have these things called annual conference, where you have a gathering of all the pastors and a gathering of lay representatives, and you come together. And every four years, you would elect delegates for general conference, which was the the worldwide gathering of Methodists. To, um, or United Methodists, I should say, to make decisions about how the church functions together. And invariably, I would hear candidates, clergy and laity, talking about why you should select me to be your representative um, because I've been a lifelong Methodist. And I'm like, well, that's great, but what is the claim there? Now, it may be I know the systems well, and I've been around, and I, I, I'm familiar with all things, and that's probably a good reason to consider somebody. But is there not a claim of privilege in that, that I've been here a little bit longer than the rest of you? 
And I think we do that not just on denominational levels. And you could pick any denomination and do that. I've been a lifelong Baptist. I've been a lifelong Catholic. I've been a lifelong this or that. But let's think about the local church. Do we do that in the local church? Where we kind of have this unspoken rule that you've got to be around for a long time. And I'll say this too. There's wisdom in making sure that someone has the gifting to serve in certain roles. I do believe that. I believe we're all gifted in different ways, and some have gifts that serve certain roles that others don't have gifts for, right? But taking that into account, I think the question for the church is, do we claim places of privilege within the church? That I was here first, that this is my pew, that this is my seat. If somebody were sitting in your chair, and most of you are sitting in the chairs I always see you sitting in, amen? <laughs> if somebody was sitting in your seat, quote, unquote, when you came in today, what would your reaction be? Man, that's where I sit. <laughs> right? Yeah. Why do we do that? Instead of, why don't we see the person as somebody who's been welcomed into the vineyard to celebrate life with God, and we say, I am so glad you are here. Can I get you some water? Can I show you where the restrooms are? Can I welcome you? You're in my sheet. Yeah? I think this says something incredible to us about the ministry of hospitality as the church and as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that we would look as the vineyard owner does to the people who are standing around hoping to be included in the vineyard. They're ready, they're willing, they're able to come. And for whatever reason, they've been passed over. They're on the margins. And we see the vineyard owner going to the people on the margins and welcoming them in now, the analogy here breaks down a little bit because you're saying, well, you're welcome in to do work. <laughs> sure. But the idea is if this is about the reign of God and the vineyard owner is seeing people that have been passed over time and time again, does that not say something about how we are to live and treat others as a sign of the reign of God? And not just those that come into our midst, but how do we do that when we go out into the community as a sign of the reign of God? We won't be all collected in the same place. Like, we're not going to all like run down to McDonald's and get lunch, right? But you're going to go out into these spaces that you live in every day, every week. And you're going to encounter people on the margins. You're going to encounter people that get overlooked, that didn't get selected for the team question that Jesus is asking us is how are you treating them? Are you treating them with generosity that he shows? Or are you claiming some kind of privilege? Because you're a part of the in crowd. Part of the beloved. And his heart is calling us to be the signs of the rain. Friends, I think this is a strong parable for us inside the church especially. God's generosity is far beyond any measure of fairness that we deserve. That should be an amen point for you. <laughs> if we were looking for what we deserve from God, probably be no payday but the generosity that we're even invited into the reign of God into the vineyard is God's gracious will that stems out of his deep deep love for you and for me and for each person you're going to encounter we don't get what we deserve in the reign of God we get his generosity and then we live in thanksgiving in response to that so I think the question for us, friends, is what's next? 
How do we live life together as a congregation, inviting people in, living into that ministry of hospitality? Maybe the next time you see somebody new come in, you give them the place of privilege, right? You make sure that they feel welcome. I think the burden's on us to do that, we who have been here for a while. The invitation also is for you to discover this generous, gracious God if you've never met Jesus. Commit yourself to him and find an alternative way of living that is going to lead you into the fullness of life. For you will thrive as a human being designed to be like him. You're made in the image and likeness of God. And he is so desperately trying to restore that in each one of us. And he came Jesus the Christ to live and teach us how to live and to die the death that we deserve so we might receive the generous gift of resurrected life. May it be so with us in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we uh, come hearing your word and hearing uh, a challenge in it that calls us to set aside the, some of the ways that we naturally think as human beings. And yet we hear an invitation in it to live life as a follower of Jesus. And in so doing, grow into the gracious, generous, God-like people that you invite us to be. So we, we pray especially, God, as your church, that we would be more faithful to the ministry of hospitality and that we would seek justice and fairness within our society for those who struggle and that we would take notice of those on the margins and invite them in to experience life with you. God, we love you and we trust you, realizing that it is all by your generous love for us that we even breathe and have life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Another great message there. We can all use this week. So I'm going to encourage y'all to stand and sing with us one last time.
little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me, a little more I'm living, everything I preach, a little more like Jesus. really good to be in worship with you this morning and um, the prayer is that you go from this place uh, trying to be a little more like Jesus um, it's not something you do on your own it's something you do with the power of, of God that spoke the universe into being dwelling in you raising you up to a newness of life so go then to be a sign of the kingdom of God that is overflowing with generosity go to love and serve all that you need in the name of Father Son and Holy